This is Private Matters. I'm Max von Prague. And the show is about authentically thriving in intimacy, sex, and marriage. It seems like a prerequisite for a good relationship, for a good marriage, is our ability to bond effectively with our partner. Today's show's topic is bonding. And Carista Luminaire is uh, an author, a consultant, counselor specializing in this topic. Welcome, Carista. Thank you, Max. Welcome to the show. Um, you are writing a book that's called Confused About Love. What a great title. Thank you, yes. I think, I think everybody should read uh, uh, this book. Uh, everybody, almost everybody I know is confused about love. Yeah, it's designed to be very simple too because most of us miss the building blocks of love which is really what occurs in our first primary love source, our mother ideally, and if we're lucky, our father, in terms of the nature of the connection, the nature of the attachment, what's often called attachment bonding, to the love source. And most of us are either securely attached or insecurely attached. And that affects our early attachment experience, affects our adult intimacy style. So you're saying that if you haven't had a good experience bonding with your with your parents or particularly with your mother, yes. then we will definitely have problems later on. You will most likely have problems unless along the way you have found someone to actually teach you how to feel the security of love. And ideally it needs to occur within the first two years of life because the whole neurology and the brain and heart are actually wired by then to be able to recognize and feel what secure attachment, a.k.a. healthy love, really feels like. And by the end of the second year, the brain development has occurred enough that the, that the wiring for this feeling of love is recognized as either feeling secure or insecure. It's very simple. Now, Kirista, it's very simple. And I'm wondering if it's gender related. In other words, if you have had tremendous problems with your mother, yes. but you have had a very safe bonding with your father and you are a man yeah. do you then have does that make any difference in your in your love life if you are heterosexual uh, um, it would make a difference if you didn't have a positive experience that gave you a sense that you were loved deeply by your mother it would most likely affect how the kind of women you choose and the and the experience of connection that you're seeking unconsciously usually it's all in the limbic center when the brain is forming this experience but of love. No, no matter how, how good my father is, um, if, if I didn't have good bonding with my mother, then I, I will struggle. Most likely. I mean, these are generalizations. But yes, unless you had a grandmother or a primary caregiver that really gave you that maternal or that feminine sense of love. And it's all wired pre-verbally so that the primary love languages of a child, of an infant, are actually three. They're through the eye, through the eye gazing, through the tone of voice, and through the touch. So a mother who gives us secure attachment or a feminine source, when we give out signs of distress, that we're in danger or we need attention, the, the experience of love is when the mother picks up the child and looks lovingly through her eyes, you're okay, you're okay, and her tone of voice is soothing and calms the agitation and it will touch the child in a way that the anxiety in the nervous system will be quelled. Whereas an insecure attachment, what they often call insecure attachment style, there are three kinds. There's what's called the avoidant attachment experience where the child puts out a sign of distress and the primary caregiver actually ignores or avoids the distress and the child is left self-soothing themselves. And they begin to make a, a, a conclusion that when I need to depend on someone and trust them, they will actually avoid me. Therefore, I start mistrusting my needs and my sense that I can depend on someone for my needs. Yes. The other insecure attachment style is called preoccupied attachment in the, in the attachment literature. Uh, some people call it avoid, um, ambiguous attachment or anxiety attachment. And that's when the love source, you put out a, a sign of distress as an infant, and they come sometimes, and they're there to what's called co-regulate you, soothe you, bring calmness to your distress, make you feel safe. That's their top priority. Other times you put out a signal of distress and they ignore you. They go into avoidance. And often this actually um, patterns how we, we seek 
love in our later relationships. So avoidant type experiences usually create avoider type adults who ignore the distress signals of their partners. An ambivalent and ambiguous attachment in secure style usually creates what we call pursuers. Yes. Yes, the more active. Yeah, more, active, more, yeah. Um, critical, frustrated, angry, agitated, aggressive, that they're trying to get the attention and it can leave at any moment. And the avoider is usually terrified mm -hmm. and usually goes into a, a place of withdrawal and um, disconnect, which creates greater anxiety for the pursuer. And they get in these vicious cycles that never can be broken until they learn how to do that, which is, again, very simple. You can actually learn how to rewire yourself into secure attachment. Is that related to, uh, to also addictive behavior or oh, yeah. like uh, yeah, uh, love addiction? Uh, love addiction usually uh, is Avoidance addiction. People always pulling back and, and the other person always looking pursuing. for... Pursuing, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very, very uh, clear connection between love addiction, sex addiction, and insecure attachment style, yeah. When you have secure attachment, which is actually 50% of the population, the, the, the sense is I can... The, the, the signs of secure attachment in an adult relationship are that the, each partner makes the other's distress a priority. That when you're distressed, especially if I've caused it, my priority is to actually soothe you and co-regulate you back to a feeling of safety and connection with me. The other's comfort, yes. The, comfort. Yeah, is, is the first priority. The partner's comfort, yeah. Yeah, because the, 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 the need is for connection. Yes. And for you being a safe source for me to feel connection and to be vulnerable, which is considered for many people to be a real sign of weakness. It's actually a sign of really having the freedom to feel you can reveal your true self and your wounded self to your partner and they will accept you unconditionally, which is where love thrives. And this is what you help people uh, with. Yes. People come to you at any age and you any help age. them effectively bond couples, yes. people it, looking for love, looking, looking for a partner. Yes. In my couples counseling, it's really a fascinating thing because I've been working with people for 33, 35 years now and uh, highly trained in many different systems mm -hmm. and went to Ivy League school and know a lot about attachment theory. It was not really until I discovered this latest research in the attachment neuroscience that everything gestalted for me because I realized you can actually rewire the couple's insecure attachment styles very quickly, primarily not by processing, as people come and talk therapy mm -hmm. and they run their stories and their agitation. Tell the truth. Tell the truth, Tell the truth. right? Yes. And in bed, they're up till five in the morning or three in the morning running their upsets with each other and they can't break the cycle and they go to bed estranged. And that's because in order for the transformation of connection to happen, one actually has to feel it in the limbic center, in the nerv nervous system. And so the pre-verbal languages of teaching couples how to use their eye gazing, their tone of voice, and their touch to actually quell the anxiety and quell the fear and the feeling of danger, emotional or physical, becomes the, what I call the building block to restore the sense of secure attachment and love. So in my relationship, we're both very savvy with you know the models and the formulas for creating connection. But what we've learned is that when one is agitated, the first thing we do is lie together in a non-sexual way and just hold each other to let the nervous system know, hey, I'm an ally here and I really care what you're feeling. And I just want you to know that I'm going to hold you through it. And the nervous system quiets down and feels like, oh, this person is making my anxiety a priority. And they're really, I can feel it through my touch. And if they can look to me with their eyes, loving eyes, not angry, upset eyes that make me feel insecure attachment, or a tone of voice that's yelling at me, making me feel like they're going to judge me or criticize me, but their voice is soothing, their touch is soothing, and their eye gazing is inviting, that will save all those hours. And I feel safe to reveal my f vulnerable feelings where I feel scared or triggered or hurt. And it takes like five or ten minutes. Just, oh, this is what I'm feeling. I don't have to defend against you. I don't feel like you're going to attack me. <clears throat> and there the intimacy is born fresh and easy. And everyone can learn it. 
It's, it sounds so simple. And uh, in a way, uh, I wish I'd met you many, many years ago. I am one of the men who, who didn't learn uh, secure attachment uh, with my mother. Yes. And uh, I, I had to go to a whole uh, lot of tumultuous experiences before women started coming into my life. It's only recently, the, the, the last few years, that I, I, I have women into, come into my life who, who naturally help me rewire or, or, or have, give me a whole different sense of, of, of well-being in their in the, in the presence. It didn't work with me through therapy. I did yeah. th th try therapy many, many times, and I just couldn't even build or, or continue to feel trust enough with the, with the therapist. Because it's the, the healing and the connection is not through the mind, which for me was a great awakening since I'm very mentally oriented and know the formulas f in a sense that we're supposed to say or do, but it's really in the nonverbal feeling centers that the connection starts to happen. So it plays out sexually as well in the sexual styles of couples, that if the style of connection actually creates a feeling of insecurity or danger for one of the partners, then usually the connection has limits and the insecurity within both of them or one of them will actually be the primary experience. So when that's going on, you know, the guidance is to slow the connection down where each person gets to report what they need to feel safe. Yes. And teach the other what their love language is, is what I call it. We call it secure attachment in the neuroscience of attachment. But I like to apply it all to love. So, you know, avoidance, insecure attachment, I call it unavailable love. And preoccupied or anxious attachment, I call it unpredictable love. And secure attachment, I call it you know, dependable, healthy love. And we need to teach each other because we have different in attachment experiences and wiring and no one knows what the other needs. But do you think that the, the, the relationship with your client should, should model that and it is through that relationship that people are going to attract better relationship or do you actually tell people what to do? Is, is, it, is it through your relationship with your client? It's both. Uh, a, a good counselor would definitely role model secure attachment. That's often what counselors are paid for, is I can come to you and actually have my anxiety co-regulated, is what they call it in the neuroscience. You are there invested in my distress and make it a priority to help me find peace, comfort around my issues that cause anxiety. Yes. That's what a good counselor does. Yes. If the counselor creates unsafety or agitation, I say move on. It's an expensive relationship. Yes. Um, the, the, then w when a couple comes to me in distress, I used to let them run their stories and hear both sides, especially if they came in a high, heightened state, so I could understand and have empathy and try to find how to solve the agitation. Now what I do is I s first ask them to slow down and connect neurologically. So I'll say, before we hear what you have to say, will you please just sit together and the one who's most agitated, I'll ask them, are you open to being touched by your partner? Yes or no? If it's yes, how would you like to be touched that would soothe you? And that's done first. If you don't want to be touched, is there a way you'd like to be looked at or talked to that would open your heart? Because that's what we're looking for. May but what if they don't know that? then that becomes its own teaching, is to teach yeah. them what that is. Because if you're sharing you're upset with me, Max, and I'm genuinely open in my mind to want to hear it, but my eyes are in a defense posture of criticism or anger or agitation at you, you're not going to feel safe if no. I say I'm listening. No. If my voice is agitated and making you feel anxious and I'm going to attack you or criticize you, it doesn't matter what you say to me, you're not going to feel safe. And there are people who are always in a certain state of agitation or, or fear and who never or rarely get to a place where they can actually allow somebody to come close to them, it's right? It's dangerous to be open. It's what we call the, the, in the neuroscience of attachment calls the state of not depending on someone, a state of self-regulation. And in the new age, and we know in you know places where we are right now in progressive California, the, the consciousness is very much be whole within yourself, be able to self-regulate yourself, be independent and not need anyone. And being one of those people historically, thank God not anymore, I thought, you know, that's it, I'm independent. I don't need to depend on anyone, which came out of my insecure attachment programming, even though I had a, 
very loving mother. She was unpredictable, bless her heart. She did her best. But I chose men where I didn't have to depend on them. It was safer because of the unpredictable love. What I learned, it was really in understanding the science of attachment, is that in order to really be a healthy self-regulator, independent, you also need to have the experience of being able to co-regulate another person. In other words, be available to help them actually find a, a loving connection when they're distressed. And what the science shows the, in, the, in the, all these 2,000 studies on, on attachment bonding, the first two years of life, 20 years of research mm -hmm. that the child who's been co-regulated by ideally both parents, but at least one, that when I'm feeling unsafe, you show me, I can trust you, and you actually help me depend on you for that, that child becomes more able to authentically self-regulate right after the experience of danger or distress, whether it's the parent that caused it or it was crawling out there in the world and wasn't sure it saw a snake or a rope and it turned back and said to the parent, is this safety or danger? And the parent says, that's actually a snake. That's dangerous. I'm going to pick you up and co-regulate you. Or no, that's actually, that little rope there is safe. You look back, you're okay, you're okay. Go out in the world again. You can depend on me. And the child then learns it can actually trust itself. What happens with the avoidant attachment child, the one whose parent never could be there to trust, they start to self-regulate off of inanimate objects, their toys. Now, the computer, the TV, and they actually become great high achievers who don't need anyone, but their leadership styles or their, even their, you know, their work relationship styles are very disengaged from people. Okay, so take for example a scenario uh, that many people can relate to where a woman has been uh, uh, physically abused by her father and the mother uh, was able to create a good bonding with her daughter, yes. but the mother didn't protect her daughter oh, yes. from the abuse. I have those which clients, classic, three of them. Classic scenario. Mm -hmm. the, then how does the child feel? They cannot really trust the mother for protecting them from the evil. Or from exactly. And, yes. and so even if the mother does very, very good uh, all these other times... Well, she's doing well in her, in her conscious spectrum of what she thinks love is. But what a really aware mother would be very keen on would be that the child's in distress, even when the child is with her or when the child is with the father, that would become something the mother would attend to. Why do you not feel safe with your father? What's going on here? Let's explore that. Why is she not feeling safe with you? And that that becomes a priority for the mother. The child then begins to trust there is someone here I can share this with. I mean, sexual abuse is very complex to heal. I have been sexually abused, luckily not by a childhood, I mean, not by a, a, a family member, but by a childhood babysitter. I know it can be healed, and I work with many women and men who have been sexually like, abused. Like, you were very young, or as a teenager? As very young, pre-verbal, too. Okay. And I, I've had a lot of trauma to my life with men mm -hmm. um, that I've healed. So I know that trauma can be healed. I can say that unequivocally. It's in the neurology. And the story, you remember Thank the story, but the you. charge can be released. I can say that, and many people who know me can verify that mm -hmm. is true. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a rageaholic father, God bless him as well, but he did his best, but based on his programming and his wiring, so I also had emotional aggression as a child. And all of that can be transformed and healed. It's mostly a neurological rewiring. And again, if you knew my history, you'd see what I've been through. Sure. You know, I thought I had really healed it. And then life circumstances showed me I had more to do. And this was the final piece, was to actually learn to be honest and vulnerable when I felt anxious and find a partner that cared about that and wanted me to feel safe. Yeah, yeah. And a, a, a very different question for you, Carista, is when, when people have uh, rewired their, mm -hmm. their, their brain and they are now comfortable in a situation that they first didn't know. Secure attachment. H how, does that, uh, how does that affect the sexual experience? Because they may be turned on by different things than sure. they thought. They, 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 it, may, it may also change what turns them on. Is that, is Absolutely. that the case? Absolutely, because they, what that really means is that they found a partner that they feel safe with to open to. So whatever 
gives them a feeling of connection and intimacy, they feel safe exploring that with their partner. And their partner will either say, you, what you wanted, the dance of intimacy you want to do with me, whether it's traditional or alternative, makes me feel safe too. So yes, I'll agree to that. But if what you're wanting me to do scares me or threatens me or makes me feel insecure, then I can't go there. And right. there, it's a mutual, mutual decision. This is a really important distinction. If you just indulge me for a minute. What's the difference, insecure attachment, what's the difference between caring for your partner's distress and making it a priority and what is often called codependency, which is where a caretaker or enabler will always make their partner's needs more important. Insecure attachment, healthy love, it's a symmetrical commitment. So I sometimes am the one that comes to you insecure and you reassure me and you have equal devotion and respect to give me the same experience as I give you. Sure. So it's a, whereas codependency is asymmetrical. Yes. And the same with sexuality. If I'm always pleasing you, but I'm feeling insecure or my needs aren't getting met, then that's a codependent asymmetrical connection. And that's not secure attachment. Understood. Because the person's not feeling good, safe. Good, good that you clarify that. Yep. However, my question yep. was about when your turn on is subconsciously connected to fear and insecurity. Yes. This is what I've known my whole life. Yep. When, when there is a little element of danger, then uh, I, I, can, I perform sex. It's, it's kind of related to the fear. Yep. When the fear is gone, mm -hmm. I may not have desire. You won't seek, your desire won't be wrapped up and intertwined with the experience of danger, so you'll seek mo more, perhaps more, deeper, richer yeah. experiences of being open without needing sex and danger to be wired together. Because basically the nervous system needs to suddenly realize hey, connection can actually be soothing or, you know, a different form of eroticism or sensuality where it allows me to feel undefended mm -hmm. and I actually can feel love, mm -hmm. you know, and other virtues, peace and harmony and happiness um, that the danger feeling may be arousing, but may not allow. Yes. Yeah, and there's no rules. There's no right or wrong. It's really what each partner wants to feel connection. Most couples don't realize that love is really the direct experience of feeling a safe, nourishing connection yes. with the other. Yes, and your message is, and, and you want, I mean, I was going to ask you, what, yeah. what's the best advice you know for couples watching who who's like, oh, how am I going to understand this? Or my, my life is, is so messy and my relationship is so tumultuous. Your message is, you can learn this. You can this learn this. This is stuff, if you, if you apply your, your, your curiosity and your intelligence to this topic, then anybody, anybody. can learn this. People Anyone can watching learn. this show, You don't need to be educated, world, you don't need to have done can, therapy, you don't you, have to... You can learn this. You could be married and divorced seven times like Elizabeth Taylor. It could be, you know, any new, young, I love to work with young couples. And it also plays out actually between, in our working relationships, how we connect or disconnect. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about romantic relationships in this particular uh, segment. The key that I've found is that both partners have to want to have mutual desire and interest to want to learn each other's love language. It's like dancing. If one partner sees a show and says, I want this. We've been in these vicious cycles. I didn't know we could repair it this way. I want secure attachment. I want to learn my partner's love language and the way they feel safe, and I want to teach it to them. Mm -hmm. And the other partner doesn't want to learn together. It's like wanting to learn the tango and only having one on the dance floor. Yeah, it doesn't work. So it, it's really a mutual desire, which is where the secure attachment and in, in the healing of the most estranged, greatest betrayal experiences can be healed. That I can say firsthand, you know, both as a clinician as, and as one who's been betrayed. All that story drops. If I know that what you did to me to hurt me was your unconscious conditioning. You didn't mean to. And you want to own and repair that, and you want to learn how to actually repair that with me, and realize that that was just your conditioning, your unconsciousness, and that you didn't feel safe to tell me why you wanted to triangulate out of the relationship, or you couldn't be vulnerable, that you were unhappy, and you now want to learn how to share that with me. Well, if I know you're going to change and you're not going to do it again, that gives me a sense that I can learn a new language of trusting you and telling you what I need to trust you. And you want to learn that? Okay. 
now possibly we can repair this. And you can, because I've worked, walked these couples through and been through these initiations. That's great. Yeah. Yes, anybody can, can repair this. The key, I've found, if I were to sum it up, one of the keys, is, it, particularly with betrayal, sexual betrayal, financial betrayal, is that both partners have to want to own and yes. repair their past. There's another element that you haven't, and, and I want to get this sure. in before the end of the, the episode, yeah. is uh, we haven't heard the word parenting yet. And yes. I know your first book, <laughs> My first book. your first book is about that, right? What's, yes, what's Parenting Begins Before Conception. Parenting Begins Before Conception. Yes. Oh, again, a wonderful title that, that speaks already uh, in many ways. Yes, it's, in many ways. It's, the book was inspired just essence when I was a young psychology major at Harvard and I realized that adults were spending their adult years healing themselves from childhood trauma and abuse and disconnection and parents didn't know how to bond with their children and so I began to search through my academic PhD, masters, etc and wrote this book as a culmination of the best of Eastern and Western thought around Bonding. So, so is one place to start for couples is to pick up a book about parenting. I mean, whether it's yours or another one. Yes, the I, book. Is that a good? Is that a good book thing? Book about parenting. There's a, a book out now that I like that kind of sums this up called "Attached" by um, I forget his first name, Levine. Um, that kind of sets some of the basics. He has three attachment styles. I and others that I use uh, for my inspiration have four attachment styles. There's another insecure attachment style we haven't talked about, which is the which is the scary parent, the traumatized attachment. And that is worth just noting here to plant the seed that those who have been traumatized with raging parents, abusive parents, it actually creates a disorder in the nervous system with the bonding primary love object, father, mother. And that's an extra layer of insecure attachment that needs to be rewired. And Got often it. is why couples, even when they're insecure attachment, in it with one of the couples, the other one will constantly go into high drama because they go, they get triggered That's and they go into a disordered state. Both, any, two couples in insecure attachment can heal together if they want to. If you have one of the couples that has had secure attachment and the other is open to their influence, one can help the other. Got and, it. And How the, can people reach you, Carista? They can reach me through my website, uh, trueself.net. I have another website, luminaryleadership.net for those in leadership and high achieving types who want to really optimize their relationships. And I actually have a parenting website, creativeparenting.com, which was my original work, which was everything's been born out of regarding understanding the True power self. of attachment. TrueSelf.net is the main one, yes. TrueSelf.net. Yes. Carista Luminaire. Carista Luminaire, yes. author, consultant, counselor. Thank you, Carista. Thank you for coming on the show today and for this very engaging and very f informative conversation about bonding. This was Private Matters. I'm Max von Prague. For more information, go to www.privatematters.tv. See you all next time. Es caminho passando bem. Quem mostrava esse caminho longe? Quem mostrava esse caminho longe? Esse caminho passando.